Hello, everyone. We have with us today, Dr. Dina Padayachi, who's a medical doctor, a graduate of Natal University in South Africa, and the recipient of the Olive Schreiner and Nadine Godimer Prizes for prose. Dr. Dina's poems have been published in India, the United Kingdom, USA, Australia, and South Africa. In particular, his book of liberation poems, A Voice from the Cauldron, was published during apartheid in 1986. Some of his works have even been translated into languages such as Khosa, Zulu, Tamil, Hindi, and Italian. Dr. Dina is also a regular speaker at literary conferences in leading universities in Germany, India, Denmark, Mauritius, US, and South Africa. Welcome, Dr. Dina. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. My pleasure, sir. Uh, Dr. Dina, before we begin, may I please request you to read out for us a few lines from uh, your books? All right. I'll, I'll start with this book here. It's called A Voice from the Cauldron, yeah. and it was published during apartheid, and um, it pays tribute. I'm sorry. As I'm getting older, I tend to get a bit emotional, but um, this, um, this poem is called Leader. And um, it, it was a tribute to our very great leaders who resisted apartheid. Okay, you're so delicate, your limbs are so thin, they can be broken so easily. You're so easy to torture, your eyes that see what we'd rather not see. Your brain that is seared by the hell of thought. Your sensitive skin. Your genitals, all so vulnerable, so easy to hurt. Why do you still care? Why do you still speak out against evil and injustice? Why do you want to die? Don't you have a sense of responsibility for yourself? We love you so much. And we, your poor, old, uneducated, exploited, weak, defenseless, tortured, bullied, hurt people need you so much. Okay, so that's the poem from that book. And then um, I want to pay tribute to our ladies and um, I think it's very important that we change the way that uh, humanity has behaved towards um, people of different colors, different cultures, different religions, and different sexes. Um, I think um, if we don't have that kind of respect for each other, we'll always have very difficult lives and the world will always be in pain. But I think it is possible to treat people better than we, than most people treat other people these days. And I think it is vital. And um, if there's any message I want to leave this afternoon to for, for those who are watching this, um, it is that our ladies are indeed very wise. So the poem was published in this book, the English Academy of South Africa, um, which comes out I think it's twice a year, this book. And um, they published it in 2020. And the English Academy of Southern Africa was the organization that awarded me my Olive Schreiner Prize for prose. So our wise ladies, men may rant and rave, invade and steal, rape and torture, destroy and slaughter, burn and pillage. But in the end, it is the wise ladies who give birth to the future. Okay, so um, um, shall we do a little bit of uh, talking and then I can come back to the um, few lines on Gandhi? Absolutely, absolutely. Right, mm -hmm. thank you. 
So um, the lines are a, a, a real uh, eye opener. Now, um, tell us, uh, Dr. Dina, you're based in uh, Durban, um, South Africa. So yeah. how much of the socioeconomic aspects of your country, uh, which we all know is rich and checkered, has figured in your writings? Virtually all of it. Um, I, I have always had a passion for history. So mm -hmm. as a child, and literature. So as a child, um, we didn't have a library. I grew up in a rural area called Amshlali. And um, so in that area, there was no water. So we had to dig a borrow and get water. There was no river nearby. And uh, the roads were dirt roads that we had to maintain ourselves. And um, electricity was something that came uh, a little bit later in my life. In childhood, I still remember we used candles and we used kerosene lamps. So it was a, co a community that was, um, um, you know, it was, uh, we were separated legally by law. So what happened was our community in Amshlali had to even build their own school. They donated their own land to build their own school. And I wrote about that in a story called A Different Kind of Standard 4, where people with very little education gave a, whatever they could to build their own school. And that's the school I attended. So um, um, uh, to, to, to get back to your question, uh, virtually everything that happened uh, you know, uh, around me uh, came into my writing. And, and uh, I tried to celebrate the people who were, you know, who were courageous enough to stand up to a system of injustice that governed virtually their entire lives. Right. Um, now, your seminal work, A Voice from the Cauldron, was published at the time of the apartheid, a very difficult socio-economic period. Can you tell us yeah. more about it? Well, what happened was um, I joined something called the South African Writers Circle. So, um, you know, um, uh, and the South African Writers Circle was for Europeans only. But um, uh, in the early 1980s, my uncle, a teacher, introduced me to the circle, which met in Durban, and he would come from Stanger a distance of about 50 kilometers in order to attend the meetings in the evening. So he was all alone. He said he was the only um, so-called non-white person in that room of maybe 50 whites. So he asked me because he knew of my interest in writing. I was already a practicing doctor at the time. And then he said, can you come after work to um, join me? And, and, and we did. We, we, we would be the only two uh, Indians in that place. And it was very difficult because the whites were not accustomed to socializing with us. And we also, you know, uh, kept our distance and, and we we tried not to get in their way and, and uh, cause any trouble. Because, uh, you know, when you're in an alien environment, you you can cause a problem. So um, th th that is the background to, to what happened. Just to repeat your question, I'm sorry, I get carried away. Uh, I, no, I said that, uh, you know, uh, your uh, seminal work, A Voice from the oh, Cauldron, was... The cauldron. Yeah. So the so, Voice from the Cauldron yeah. came from um, um, my um, attending those meetings and entering poetry competitions and, and uh, prose competitions. So um, when I saw what kind of poetry was being published by other writers, I thought I would write about what was virtually always banned in South Africa. In other words, anti-apartheid literature, right? Um, the authors were banned, the writers were banned, but I felt very, very strongly about what was happening. So I would write letters to the editor of newspapers. I would, um, uh, you know, I couldn't stop pouring out my thoughts. I, I would just be scribbling all over the place in little booklets. A lot of it got lost, but um, what survived went in of poetry and um, I think the apartheid government uh, when it was launched in I mean it was published in 1986 launched at Natal University in 1987 um, at the university so um, even though it was anti-apartheid I think 
that the perhaps I'm trying to think about how these races thought. Um, they probably thought nobody reads poetry, right? And then um, they they um, they probably thought it, it didn't mean anything, and uh, they would have had their academics, in other words, apartheid academics, would have analyzed my book and probably thought it was of no significance, you know. So I think, but from that time, I know I was monitored. So your telephone was bugged. The post which arrived in your post box would arrive without stamps. So what would happen is that the, the envelope would be opened and then put into another envelope and, um, you know, um, put into your post box. So they, they monitored everything. Um, it's far worse today, quite frankly, because of technology. But back then, uh, you quickly became aware that they they didn't like what you were writing and what you were saying and i was visited by the apartheid police as well this was the special branch and they came to my surgery and said i should stop doing this because they said that the white writers uh, wrote about the flowers and animals and, and all these nice things nature so i should write about that and i shouldn't write about apartheid but of course i never stopped right absolutely which is why we got your brilliant uh, pieces to read and experience. So yeah. uh, now, as a writer and doctor, you've passed through some of the most turbulent times in your country's history. And you're also yes. seeing how times are changing today. Yes. What are some of your experiences living through this transition? Uh, you know, uh, and how would you describe this change? What's your take? Oh, that's that's a very it's a very relevant question, but also very very difficult because um, the the people who came into power um, were what I call the melanin blessed. Okay, most of them were melanin blessed, which means melanin is color. So the blessing of your color protects you from skin cancer, wrinkles, blemishes, and that sort of thing. So uh, it's got a protective physiological function. Um, blessed by us by, by God that we've got this color. We've got more than people who don't have melanin or who have less melanin. So um, the way indoctrinated at school, we were made to feel very bad about our skills. All right. So, and we went to segregated schools, segregated universities, uh, segregated faculties. Natal University was for Europeans only, but they had a separate faculty of medicine where only the melanin blessed were allowed to study. Our lecturers came from all, all kinds of groups, African lecturers, we had uh, Indian lecturers, European lecturers, but um, Europeans were not allowed to study at my faculty of medicine. All right. So, um, you know, um, uh, if you understand that the people who came into power came from a disadvantaged educational background, okay? So the schools were in very bad shape. Uh, the so-called non-white schools were in very bad shape during apartheid. More money was spent on the white child than on the non-white child. Okay, and they were quite upfront about this. And it was to the order of like hundreds of, um, like if they spent one rand on an African child, they'd spend a hundred rand on a white child. Okay, so it was it was terrible. And um, you know, I I really respect the Africans especially who came through that. Uh, very disadvantaged era, and yet became doctors, lawyers, professors, and, and really excelled, you know. But they were of a different category from, um, unfortunately, today's category. So today, things are very difficult um, in so many respects. Um, everything needs more attention. And I think one of our biggest problems is that we are not taught at school to be patriotic. Now, what I've noticed when I met people from India um, is that they tend to be very patriotic. They, they, they love their country and they understand the history and the heritage and the culture and they respect the leaders who transform the country. Unfortunately, um, it's not so much like that here. History was not studied at our schools, was not a compulsory subject at our schools. I'm talking about primary and high school, secondary school. Um, in 1994 when we got the vote. 1994, for the first time, we were allowed to vote with everybody else. But unfortunately, uh, history was taken out of the syllabus. Now, I studied history at school right up to metric. So I did like 12 years of history. But 
the children coming out of school, including my own children, were coming out of school not knowing anything about history. And when I spoke to my own children about apartheid, they didn't want to hear about it. And I can understand that because it's such a painful thing to realize that your parents went through this. Your grandparents, who you love so much, went through this. So it, it needed to be done in a detached, unemotional manner by teachers who were schooled in the subject of history. But what does our government do? We get rid of history. So at the moment, they're trying to reintroduce history. So that's one of our big problems, because where do you teach love for your country? You teach it at school. You teach it at home as well. But you need professionals to explain to the children why they should respect their country. They should not litter. They should look after the, the public um, institutions like the universities, the roads, the the buildings, the libraries, the schools, that we should care for all that. Now, that's what we were taught, at, uh, ironically, during apartheid in our schools. And our parents taught us this. And they taught us to respect everybody. But unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be uh, at the forefront anymore. So when you've got people who don't understand these concepts and don't want to understand it, unfortunately, it, it makes life very difficult for everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, now coming to uh, something uh, very um, interesting, how relevant uh, do you think uh, is Gandhi and Mandela today um, and uh, the work that they have done? Uh, what's your take on that? Okay, uh, if the world knows about Gandhi and Mandela, but I must just mention that there are thousands of other leaders who, who gave their blood, uh, who died in the struggle. You know, um, Gandhi and Mandela didn't actually die. You know, um, Gandhi died in India, but uh, Mandela was incarcerated for over 27 years, but he wasn't actually murdered. But um, uh, I'll just mention a few of the leaders who were murdered. There's a Dr. Ribeiro um, and his wife, also a doctor in Pretoria, the capital of our country, who were murdered during apartheid. Then there's lawyers like Griffiths and his wife, Victoria M. Genke. They were murdered in that struggle. And then we had Steve Biko, who I knew personally. He was a medical student at our faculty of medicine. He was murdered by the apartheid police. All right. And then this Ahmed Tamal was a teacher. He was also murdered. There are thousands like that. But to answer your question, let's get back to Mandela and um, Gandhi. Um, I think, um, you know, there, there's so much that can be said about both of them. But they gave their lives for South Africa and for the world, what I call the melanin blessed world, that when they were born was largely ruled by people of European origin. All right. So um, if you talk to a lot of South Africans, they don't even seem to understand that. They don't realize that in 1869, when Gandhi was born or when uh, Mandela was born in 1918, um, they, uh, the, the, most of the world was ruled by people who were not, um, you know, who had a melanin deficiency in their skins, you know, and we had to make this colossal struggle. When I say we, the melanin blessed people had to make this colossal struggle to liberate their country, um, their countries uh, from um, foreign rule and, you know, develop the ability to rule themselves. So um, Gandhi and Mandela are obviously heroic figures, um, who, um, you know, are an inspiration, were an inspiration to me when I was a child, and uh, I continue to be an inspiration to me. But unfortunately, a lot of the younger people don't seem to understand this. And um, they, they look at flaws, and it's easy to find flaws in me, you, and everybody. I don't think we should put anybody on a pedestal and say they are flawless. And I know Mandela kept telling everybody he's not a saint. And, and, you know, he made a lot of mistakes. And Gandhi did the same. I mean, uh, Gandhi no way said he's a Mahatma or whatever, you know. And, and I mean, that's how we should regard people. We, you know, we, we shouldn't um, say, oh, these people are without blemishes and whatever. But if we want to grow, we need to take the lessons from the people who um, did so much for the world. Now, I read Gandhi's autobiography. It was given to me as a gift by my grandfather, who loved Gandhi, worshipped Gandhi. He had a huge picture of Gandhi in his study uh, in Stanga. And so he, um, Mr. Anar Padiachi, gave me this uh, 
um, um, this book called Autobiography of Gandhi. And so I look at this and I read it and there's a line from it, which I will quote now, uh, which, which, um, which meant a great deal. I think he was the first melanin-blessed author I ever read because all the books that I studied for 12 years at my apartheid schools were written by European people, not by people like me. Okay, so Gandhi said he was um, ejected from a train um, in Peter Maritzburg, which is the capital of KwaZulu Natal, where I live. And he was ejected from this train because the compartment he was in, which was supposed to be a first class compartment, was designated for Europeans only. So some Europeans sold him a ticket, which he was not supposed to, right? And he knew that Gandhi would be embarrassed and humiliated. And so Gandhi was kicked out of that train and left on the platform of uh, Peter Maritzburg Station. And he describes this whole thing quite unemotionally, but right at the end in the um, sort of final paragraph of that chapter, he says, it is a mystery to me how a person can feel honored by the humiliation of his fellow human beings. Now, in South Africa, we were being humiliated virtually on a daily basis. I mean, we were being embarrassed and our feelings meant nothing. And we were trampled on and insulted and hurt. And, um, you know, it was disgusting behavior that was sanctioned by law. Law said we could legally be embarrassed. So we couldn't enter libraries. We couldn't enter hotels. We couldn't enter restaurants. Couldn't enter hospitals. Ambulances were dis designated for Europeans only. And then they had equivalents for us, okay? Um, they even had lifts, you know, elevators in buildings. They had one for non-whites and then the other one for Europeans only. And they had African guards who would stop us from entering the Europeans only lift. People like me tried to enter the Europeans only lift and got told very quickly, get out, you know? Uh, and we did that as a way of resistance because we didn't want to um, make the Europeans feel that we accepted what they were doing to us, that there was, you know, perhaps uh, the wrong thing uh, being done. But um, the Europeans somehow have this crazy idea, a lot of them, that uh, we're actually uh, happy with apartheid uh, because we didn't show so much resistance. So, so th th that was very important. Now, Gandhi built a home. He stayed 21 years in South Africa, but he built a home and an ashram, a uh, Kasturba Gandhi school, printing press, um, and, and other buildings, uh, including a medical clinic um, in an area uh, called Inanda, and it was called the Phoenix Ashram. So when I was a medical student, I was, um, uh, you know, a bunch of us medical students would go on Sundays to help out at the clinic. And the senior medical students would actually do the prescriptions, but we would obviously learn. Um, you know, we'd sit with these, all, you know, um, uh, senior medical students, and we would learn from them, and we would examine patients and that sort of thing. Um, but the diagnosis was obviously made by the senior people, and we had uh, medicines donated for the clinic. So the clinic was in this Gandhi ashram. So I was familiar with the place, and um, it it left a deep impression on me because I walked into Gandhi's home which was like a museum. I walked into his home. I saw his sandals, his spectacles, Kasturba Gandhi's blouse, his bed, his dressing table, you know, all kinds of things. And having read his autobiography, obviously it had a great impact on me to, to be in that kind of environment. So um, I wrote about it in a short story called The Visitor, which has been published all over the world. It has been translated into Tamil um, in Chennai by a magazine called Subalakshmi and translated into Hindi by a magazine called Hans in Delhi. And it's been published in England and uh, obviously in South Africa. But during apartheid, it couldn't be published in South Africa. So most of my work uh, could not be published during apartheid. Okay, because the editors, the people who were in charge of the literary journals wouldn't let us, um, wouldn't accept our short stories and poetry for publication. And, they, and because I was somebody who wasn't in the literary field, um, you just sort of felt like you, your work was not good enough, you know. But when what happened was one of my friends uh, suggested I send my work to America, to a magazine called, a literary journal actually, called Short Story International based in New York. And there was a lady there called Sylvia Tanko. And when I sent my first short story to her, um, it, was, it was amazing. I mean, she just accepted it immediately. And then she sent me a letter to that effect. Now, you'll find this interesting. I had to get another post box. 
because I knew my, my post box was being monitored. So I got another post box and I had to do correspondence with her through another post box. And when I posted things to her, I never posted from my segregated group area. Um, I would go to a white area and then get stamps and then post it from there. OK, so that was the kind of um, gauntlet that we had to survive. So um, um, this I'll just quote uh, just a few lines from this uh, short story called The Visitor. It's the concluding short um, lines from the short story. The, there had been a kind of unearthly peace in that old ashram, a kind of freshness, a crispness of the air that left you exhilarated, the peace seem to suffuse you and calm you, no matter what the turmoil in your soul. Till that day when we looted the place, somehow when that old man turned on his heel and strode off from the ashram, all the peace in the place seemed to leave with him. And I didn't feel like stealing after that. In fact, I felt quite miserable. I felt, God help me, like a horse in a fox hunt, like a bullet from a robber's gun. But I kept the old desk, and at times when I look long and hard at it, I think I can see the old man's face looking up at me and his eyes seem bright with life. Okay, let me just give you some context to what I've just read. Um, on the 9th of August, 1985, I witnessed the ashram being destroyed. I was rioting in this place called Inanda, which was a rural area. And basically at that time, if you try to do anything uh, unlawful, you would be very quickly dealt with. But uh, for four days, um, rioting occurred in Nanda, and the police and the army did nothing about it. Okay, What they did was they sealed off the area. So I, from an adjacent hill, could witness what was happening, but I couldn't go there. Okay, And so I wrote a short story from the point of view of a person who's busy plundering the place, okay? Um, he knows nothing about Gandhi. He knows nothing about the ashram, but he knows that a poor man like him who's unemployed, who's got a bit of education, but um, you know, he, he, he basically is destitute, um, he can now steal and the police won't do anything, right? So while he's busy destroying the place along with a whole lot of other people, uh, in the middle of all this, he meets an old man, a very old man. And this old man is very thin. He's got some white clothes crazily wrapped around his semi-naked body. And he's wearing sandals and obviously spectacles. So, and he's carrying a staff. And um, they have a little conversation. And um, this, this old man picks up the lid of a desk. And inside the desk, is a book and the book is called Autobiography of Gandhi. So when I described the old man in those concluding lines, you can guess who I was describing. Absolutely. That, that, that is so powerful. That is a really powerful um, description. Um, I would love to read more of that. Um, now, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Adina, apart from writing and being a medical professional, what were your socio-political involvements pre and post the apartheid uh, struggle? Okay, um, during apartheid, my contribution was virtually totally literary, so it was all about writing, writing and thinking. So I would take a term like non-white and literally turn it on its head. So I would tell my friends, don't you think that we shouldn't be described in negative terms? Now, I wasn't the only one who said this. Um, Steve Biko said it. A lot of people said it. They said, look, we need to speak of ourselves in positive terms. At that time, uh, uh, Steve Biko and others decided that we could call ourselves black. And black meant anybody who was melanin enriched, which meant the Indians, the people of mixed race, and the Africans, all of whom were denied the franchise, okay? So that was the kind of thing I, I did during that time. Like for instance, these days, when you talk about what's happening now, we, uh, a term in, in vogue, which is, seems to be acceptable to most people, is the term ethnic cleansing. Now, I don't agree with that term because I can't see how 
murder can be described as cleansing. Okay, so I think that respectable people and respectful people should not use the term. Okay, and if they do use the term, they should condemn it. Right, so that's the kind of thing I still do. You know, I, ca I came up with the term melanin enriched um, about 10 years ago, and then I changed it to, well, I added to it by now saying melanin blessed, you know, um, and I don't use the term non-white because, you know, the way I used to describe it back during apartheid, um, even a flower is not described as a non-weed. Okay, so a flower is a flower, a weed is a weed. Why should we, as human beings, be described in negative terms? But of course, that negative term goes back to the fact that most of the world was conquered, uh, invaded, conquered, and colonized by Europeans. So the world got divided into European and non-European. And, and we should now, you know, um, develop the insight to realize that we need to liberate the English language, you know, and, and uh, free it from negative concepts. Because I can tell you, people like me and a lot of, uh, um, the majority of South Africans are melanin blessed. We still feel very bad about our skills. Uh, we, we, we can see the expressions on people who are light-skinned, like there are light-skinned Indians like yourself, and there's uh, dark-skinned Indians. The light-skinned Indians, when they look at us, you can see how they look at us. They don't look at us, you know, with any kind of affection or respect a lot of the time. So um, you, you can see that comes from the indoctrination they've had, the colonization. People still talk of black male and a black knight and, and black people and, and all that, you know. And, and we need to understand that God created the color black. God, God created all the colors. We should respect all the colors and understand why there are different colors, why there are different cultures, why there are different religions, why there are different types of people. And I think this is where my medical training and my training in psychology and psychiatry has helped me, you know. So I, I'm a bit of a pain, I must tell you, in certain groups, WhatsApp groups and all that, because when they say something which, I, you know, which is colonial or you know, there'll, there'll be non-white people. I call uh, if I don't like a person, I call him a non-white. So, <laughs> so there'll be a non-white person saying something which is disrespectful to people like us, and I will voice my objection. I will say, you know, and so, um, you know, and, and a lot of the times, um, you know, I I, have, I I leave groups where I find it difficult, um, and these are groups which are predominantly uh, melanin and blessed. But um, what, what do you do? Because they, they, they say things that you, 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 know, you can't agree with. And when you express yourself, they start attacking you. And there'll be 10 of them and you yourself. So what do you do? So the best thing is to leave with dignity. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, now, what is South Africa like today after all the struggles that you know, it has gone through? Uh, what is it like today? Uh, what are some of the social challenges today? And how do you envisage um, you know, the future of the country? Okay, we had, um, we've had terrible things happen. Um, I, I might as well just tell you this because it's important, I think. Um, um, you know, um, uh, the crime rate has skyrocketed. The crime against people has skyrocketed. And I think that one of the big problems is that we have a legal system. Um, we have lawyers and judges that um, have implemented laws or, or legislative laws rather. Um, the implementation of laws is more difficult, but uh, we feel that a lot of the laws are not suitable for South Africa. And I'll give you a simple example. If you take an artery in a, in a person, right, an artery that supplies, coronary artery that supplies the heart, you block the heart tree, the, um, that part of the heart gets ischemic and dies. Okay, you, you block a part of the, an artery to the brain, that part of the brain becomes devoid of blood and oxygen, and it will die. Um, it's legal in South Africa and many other countries for people to have public demonstrations on major highways, on major roads. Let's not say highways, but on major, but I've seen it on major highways as well. And I think that is insane. You know, if an ambulance is trying to get to a hospital and the road's blocked, 
by demonstrators. That is wrong. That will kill the people in the ambulance. Okay, so that happens. That's legal in South Africa. That's a law that should go away. You know, it should never be legal to demonstrate on a road. You know, if you have a demonstration, you can have it on a public ground. You can have it on a pavement, maybe. Uh, you can have it in a park. Uh, you can have, and then, you know, you these days you get TV coverage and radio coverage and all that. So your message will get out there. But there's no need to, to cause harm to people in your desire to stop harm coming to yourself. And, and that's one of the great ironies in South Africa. I must also mention this book I read from, um, What's Love Got to Do With It? Um, and uh, it's 10 short stories. What happened was it was published by the Congress of South African Writers in um, 1990, um, 19, let's get this right, 1992, December. And um, things were such in South Africa, we hadn't yet got the vote and all that. And it was a transition phase of great violence. So when the book was launched, and um, I obviously went with my wife to, for the launch in Johannesburg, I didn't tell most of the people I knew about the fact that my book was getting launched. Can you believe that? Because it was so dangerous. My book is full of anti-apartheid short stories, you know? And I knew that a lot of people, even non-white people, loved apartheid. They loved social, uh, residential segregation. They, they liked segregated schools. There's a lot of apartheid things that the apartheid people did that they actually liked. So I was the kind of person who in my Indian community was often in a minority. So, um, um, you know, because the Indian, a lot of Indian people felt that they were safer with the uh, apartheid police around, okay? But now I was writing against apartheid, so I was a problem. So um, when the book was launched in Johannesburg, um, uh, I, I, I didn't tell my South African writers circle. You know, um, uh, and they got quite angry with me afterwards when, when I went to the next meeting. They said, How can you not tell us? So I said, No, um, until something happens, I'm not going to tell anybody about it. And in fact, for this interview as well, you know, I've told nobody because of the kind of problems I've had. I've had my Zoom meetings interrupted, I've had the connection drop for no reason at all. Um, recently, I had a Facebook watch interview, and uh, what happened was um, the, the person doing the interview could hear me, I could hear them, but when, the, when we tried to watch it on Facebook, you could only hear my voice. You couldn't hear his voice at all. So we get paranoid. We, 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 we just don't know why these things happen, but a lot of bad things happen. So anyway, the, the book was launched in December 1992. On the 19th of January 1993, I heard my wife scream downstairs at my home at 8.30 in the morning. So I came out of my bedroom upstairs, and then I see these two guys running up the stairs, um, identically dressed, black T-shirts, young guys, um, and um, blue jeans. When I say young, they probably were in their 20s. The one in front had a knife. The one behind had a gun. And I was shocked. I, I mean, I just couldn't understand what was happening. So before I knew what was happening, this guy in front with the knife, stabbed me on my hand and my forearm and you probably can't see it but on my upper arm um i was trying to block his attack and he what was interesting and surprising was that he never demanded anything and he never asked where's the money give me your money or or, or your valuables he just asked for nothing he just attacked me so i dived back into my bedroom closed the door locked it and call the police. Now, he could have smashed the door. I mean, the, the, the lock was not uh, anything major. So he could have, he, between the two of them, they could have gotten the room and attacked me, but they didn't. So um, I re later read a book called Inside Boss, Inside the Bureau of State Security. And what these agents did uh, was they terrorized you if they didn't like what you were saying and doing, but they actually were not supposed to be thieves. So they didn't steal. Now, unfortunately, these days, the secret police steal as well. <laughs> so in, in some senses, it's actually got worse, you know. Uh, so, um, you know, unfortunately, they can get in your car, they can get in your house, they, they can get into anything, you know, and they can monitor your phone calls still. So life is very difficult if you want to be honest. Um, my Facebook page is virtually blocked. Virtually nobody sees my Facebook post. So when I put something out there, hardly anybody even sees it to like it. 
So, and, um, you know, and Facebook is always uh, telling me I shouldn't have written this, I shouldn't have posted that. So, you know, there's various ways that they can get at you and stifle you and st suffocate your opinions, you know, but um, I, I still continue. So in, uh, to get back to your major question about what's happening these days, um, it's it's um, the crime rate, as I said, has gone out of, you know, out, out of beyond belief and uh, physical violence is a reality. Um, what happens is our vehicles can get hijacked, our homes get burgled. And, and I'll, I'll describe something to you that for me sums up what is so wrong with our country. Um, we were actually away from home and we got a phone call to say our home had been burgled. And we have alarm systems, we have armed response, so everybody responded. So virtually nothing was stolen, but they set fire to an air conditioning unit outside my house. And they also set fire to the carpet inside the house. But we didn't really find too much had been stolen uh, because the armed response came quite quickly. Now, when the detectives came, the police detectives came, they, they examined the damage and then they said, another policeman, another detective is going to take control of this case. I said, why? I said, would you like to be treated by a doctor who didn't examine you? Okay, that's wrong, right? But in South Africa, that is how some of the things are done. The police detective who, who, who knows what has happened sometimes doesn't even speak to the neighbors, okay? And I mentioned this to our president at a public meeting about the fact that the police need to change their tactics and the way they deal with crime. So a major portion of our crime is not solved. And when it is brought to court, um, the people who've stolen hundreds of millions of rands um, just keep getting called back to court, called back to court, but they don't go to jail. And people who uh, whistleblow about the, the wrong that is being done in South Africa um, have been murdered, we had a lady called Babita Diokaran at the Department of Health who was murdered. Um, and uh, the people who, who, you know, who planned the assassination and did what they did have been arrested. Uh, but so far, I, 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 maybe they've been sentenced. I don't know. But that kind of thing. We've had one whistleblower, a man called Ethel Williams, because there's a lot of corruption in South Africa in every department, including the health department, um, uh, who had to flee South Africa because of all the threats he was getting. And because these days, and I think this happens in every country, um, whistleblowers really throw away their lives because uh, where are you safe? You know, will the police protect you? You know, um, can you, is there a safe house? How do you live some kind of life? How do you pursue your career if criminals are out to get you? And we've had senior policemen murdered as well. So, um, it is a very difficult country, and I've given my life for this country. When a lot of my relatives and friends left the country, I stayed on. And, you know, um, when people said, you should go, and I said, no, um, this is my country. Um, you know, I write about this country. I can't go to another country and write about India, for instance. I don't know India. Um, I, I can't write about England or any other country, but I can write about my country. And despite all the you know, trauma that a lot of South Africans have endured, uh, people who think like me feel that we should be loyal to our country. And when we expose wrong and injustice, we do it because we love our country, not because we hate our country. And we have to get the message out there to all the people in power, because I've got no power. Um, I, I don't have any kind of official position in anything. Um, uh, you know, I haven't uh, uh, followed a political path. I haven't um, stood for any election. And uh, because I, I don't think it's right for somebody like me to do that. I think it's right for me to, to see what I see and then along with thousands of others support justice. And uh, when injustice perpetrated, especially by people charged with maintaining justice, we need to highlight it. Absolutely, so profound. I mean, it's it's... It's so in, in, insightful to hear what you've, uh, you know, you've, you're going through and what your country is experiencing. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Dina, tell me, what, what, what are some of your new books that are coming up? What do you have in the works? What can we expect from you? Yeah, that is a very difficult problem for me because the kind of things I write, um, literally nobody wants to publish, okay? 
So, um, and and uh, when they want to publish, they want to uh, take control of it. And I'll give you another example. When my book, uh, my book was prescribed for Matrix for two years. Okay, the one, what's love got to do with it? So it was prescribed and now I needed to find a publisher because my own publisher, and this, this will also illustrate what's happening in South Africa. My publisher, Congress of South African Writers, who was publishing books by people formerly disenfranchised and whose books should have been in every library, in every school, whatever, um, uh, we're not getting to the bookshops. The bookshops in South Africa are largely controlled by people of European origin, okay? They don't like our books. And they, they've told me thousands of times, don't write what you're writing, don't write about your history, don't write about apartheid, by your history, I mean South African history, because nobody's interested. They've actually told me this at public gatherings. They get very angry with me, you know? And um, so they control the publishing houses, a lot of the mainstream publishing houses, right? Which are professional. So um, I'm not saying that the uh, melanin blessed publishing houses are not professional, but it is a problem. It is a problem to, to, to get your work published and to get it out there. And I'm one of these people, if I wrote something, I don't want somebody to come along and change it. Okay, so I was very fortunate in all my books. I, I wrote a book also for um, young people uh, to warn them about AIDS, which is published by Macmillan. So in my books, um, uh, largely, not completely with the, the Macmillan book, but with the other two books I mentioned, The Voice from the Cauldron and What's Love Got to Do With It, it's my work. Um, nobody came along and changed, uh, how can I put it to you, uh, a phrase or, 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 or rewrote something that I wrote, because I don't allow that. You know, if, if you want to rewrite what I wrote, then it's your book, not my book. So I'm, I'm very, very critical of editors who do that. So my next book will probably be self-published, right, or pu published in another country, uh, and um, it'll be a book. Um, I'm thinking of a book of poetry, short stories, prose. I've written essays. I do movie reviews. So it will be an eclectic uh, combination of writing, you know. And um, a simple thing like getting my next book onto PDF is a major problem for me, okay. Um, I, I've spoken to hundreds of people, and uh, it's, it's so difficult. They, they, um, they, they've all got their own agendas, you know. And I can't afford to something to have something come out with my name under it, and it's actually something else. But I'm looking forward to getting my next book published, and I, 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 I hope I mean, when it happens, I will let you know. <laughs> Absolutely, and and I look forward to reading it too because your your books are so um, evocative. They speak so much. They they convey so many deep messages. So I look forward to reading it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, Dr. Dina, I, I would love to speak more, but we are running out of time. Okay, it was an absolute pleasure. It was an absolute pleasure and honor talking to you. Uh, please, let's have uh, more conversations around, uh, you know, the, the topics that we spoke about. So uh, thank you very much for joining us on this program. Uh, yeah. Look forward to reading your works. Yes. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anita. It's been an absolute honor and privilege. Let's hope the YouTube <laughs> interview is not sabotaged in any way. <laughs> and both our uh, voices will be heard this time. And um, I, I, I consider it a great privilege. And I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled and, and delighted with the way you conducted this interview as well, because you did it very professionally and you did it with a great deal of if I may say so, respect and um, a great deal of empathy. So thank you so much. And I wish you all the best in your career as well. You and your husband and, and um, you know, your entire production. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Zina. Thank you so much.